if you were to look back at biblical commentaries from the Reformation and the post-Reformation period, you would find that many of them, many of them, actually grew out of sermon series preached in ordinary churches. If you were to check with the authors of sort of more popular level commentaries on devotional commentaries on Scripture today, you would find that many of them also grew out of some sermons that these pastors preached in ordinary churches. And so it seems that it's a bit of a normal thing for those called to ministry that they turn their material constructed for a specific people into works that might serve the broader people of God. And that impulse didn't begin at the Protestant Reformation, though, nor even with the inventing of the printing press. We actually find that practice built right into Scripture itself. Micah was a prophet called to minister in Judah, and he preached oracles that he received from the Lord during the reigns of three different kings listed in our text tonight. And at some point towards the end of Micah's ministry, the Holy Spirit, who had inspired Micah's prophecies in the first place, went on to inspire him to bind his, for maybe lack of a better term, infallible sermons that he'd already delivered, marks them different from ours, of course, into a book so that all of God's people, and especially later generations, could profit from them. And so the book of Micah is a collection of his sermons that were composed throughout his lengthy ministry compared to some of the other prophets. And Micah 1 verse 1 tells us that the prophet received God's word during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, who all reigned in the southern kingdom of Judah. And so what this tells us is that Micah's ministry, so to give us some, some perspective on this book, where, where did this happen, what's going on here, we can situate Micah's ministry within the events described in 2 Kings 15.32 through chapter 20, verse 21. So the, the possible time span for everything within uh, the, in Micah is from 750, if you like this stuff, I really think this stuff's cool, so I hope you do too. Uh, 750 BC, when Jotham began to rule, to 686 BC, when Hezekiah died. Now, it's likely sort of Micah began during Jotham's kingship, not sort of the year he began to be king. And likely right before the Assyrians attacked and seized the northern kingdom of Samaria in 722. And sometime during Hezekiah's reign, I'm going to quit saying dates here in just a second, don't worry. Uh, sometime during Hezekiah's reign, Micah, inspired again by the Holy Spirit, bound together his sermons from over the years of his ministry so that God's word would be preserved for us. And so... There is a reason why all this dating stuff is important, and it's because perhaps you noticed when we read through 2 Kings 15 together that there was this reoccurring phrase about each of the kings that reigned in Judah, something like, and the high places were not removed. Now, these high places are centers for worshiping pagan gods, which means that idolatry and worship of false deities resided within God's own nation. We can think back even about that account of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, that primeval instance of creatures trying to build their way up will build a tower high enough to reach heaven. If we could put it in another term, building a high place. And then we read in Micah 1, 3, for behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, his temple in Jerusalem, 
and will come down to tread upon the high places of the earth. And so we see that Micah is really concerned, rightfully so, with the problem of rampant pagan worship spread throughout God's own people. And it's a direct concern for Micah and all of the prophets. Now, okay, so we're not going to repeat everything that we talked about this morning in Joel, but I hope you remember one point, that the prophets were covenant lawyers, right? God had made a covenant with his people, a formal legal relationship that bound God and his people to keep their sides of the relationship. And the prophets were God's agents who prosecuted Israel, brought charges against them when the nation broke the covenant with God. Micah is one of those covenant lawyers, and the widespread paganism was one feature of godless Israel. And now, the, as, we, as we heard in that first reading, the reign of Uzziah had brought the good king, you know, had brought many good things to Israel. And in Micah's time, they still enjoyed some material prosperity. And that, however, proved to be a mixed blessing for them. Material blessings denigrated into materialism. People turned religion into an easy way of achieving their own desires and personal and social values unraveled. They forgot that inevitable sanctions would come upon continual violations of God's covenant, as we've already highlighted both times that we thought together about the book of Joel. And that deteriorating culture in Israel's religious life forms the context for the book of Micah as we dive into this first chapter. So, all right, let's think about the whole book. All right, what, what's the, what perspective can we take on the whole thing? It falls into roughly three parts, and the first part is chapter one to three, and that section as a whole has been called the Book of Doom, which is just a great title, isn't it? That should make you excited to hear about at least the first three chapters. Chapter 1 contains two of Micah's sermons. The first in verses 2 to 7 against both Judah, the southern kingdom, and Samaria, the northern kingdom, before the Assyrians attacked Samaria, as verse 5 indicates for us. The second sermon fills verses 8 to 16 and looks back on Samaria's fall in 722, which 2 Kings 17 recounts for us. And there in the second half of the chapter, Micah used Samaria's destruction as a warning against Judah, which likely situates this second sermon during the reign of the wicked king Ahaz, described in 2 Kings 16 when the Assyrian threat loomed large for Judah as well. So, Micah bound together two sermons from different times in his ministry to show that his first prediction of destruction against Samaria and Judah had already come half true. And Judah should lament and repent as judgment is quickly coming upon them as well to complete that prediction. So, the main point for our sermon tonight as we think through this text, God is only safe if we come to Him in Christ. God is only safe if we come to Him in Christ. And we'll think about this in three points, the untamed God, the undomesticated God, and the unpredictable God. So first, the untamed God. (coughs) Okay. Can everybody still hear me? Can I just leave that? Okay. Uh, Every minister at some point (laughs) apparently has to quote C.S. Lewis. 
<laughs> and I've resisted that until right now, but for better or worse, my time has come. So, as many of you know, in Lewis's story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the lion Aslan is the allegorical representative of Christ. And one of the children in this story hears about the famed lion and asks if Aslan is safe. Mr. Beaver, a talking beaver, replied, of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king. And that insight about the fictional Aslan gives us a fair entry point into this text of the first chapter of Micah. So again, there's two sermons here. In verses 2 to 7, Micah calls the entire people of Israel to know that God is coming in judgment. Verse 2, hear you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So perhaps you know, uh, yeah, I've talked about it a little bit, but I should make it really clear. So perhaps you know that the kingdom of Israel, so the whole country, split into the northern kingdom called Israel, which makes it a little confusing. Uh, with its capital being Samaria, and then the southern kingdom called Judah, with its capital being Jerusalem, after King Solomon. And so here, pay, what's going on in this verse, pay attention, O earth, is actually di- uh, addressing both kingdoms, since the Hebrew word for earth can be translated land, so it's the whole land. So this is against the people of God. And we've already seen in verse 3 and 4 that God is coming in wrath from His temple to strike down the places of pagan worship in the promised land. Verse 5 tells us why. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? So, What is the sin of the northern kingdom? Is it not Samaria, its capital city? And what is the high place? Notice that phrasing. The high place of Judah. Is it not Jerusalem? And verse 7 clarified even further that the issue is idolatry and pagan worship so heinous that they have even funded it from sexually immoral work. And then in the second sermon, Micah laments as Samaria has fallen, and that curse will inevitably fall upon Judah. In verse 9, God's curse is what he refers to as her incurable wound that penetrates into Judah all the way to the gates of Jerusalem. God's curse is coming all the way for Jerusalem. Verse 10 to 16 proclaim the disaster of this destruction to specific cities throughout the land. And that I hope that gives us a handle on on sort of the scope and the point of the text itself. But what further significance can we make of this? We we looked at another judgment oracle in Joel 1 this morning, and we considered ourselves in the shoes of those enduring judgment. And I sort of figured you didn't want to hear that sermon a second time. And so instead of repeating that approach of thinking of ourselves on the ground with these Israelites, what I want to do this time is think about what this judgment oracle teaches us specifically about the doctrine of God. What can we learn about who God is from this text, His 
character, if we can put it that way. And that's why we take our lead from C.S. Lewis, depicting his divine figure as not a safe lion, but a good lion. And we see in this text, in some very real respects, God is not a safe God. As much as God is certainly trustworthy, we have to come to grips with the fact that God will always be high above us. We must not treat God trivially. It is more dangerous to do that than playing with fire. Certainly God is merciful, but God may choose to cease His season of mercy. As verse 12 says, because disaster has come down from the Lord to His gate of Jerusalem. So, to put this in another Lewis quote, he's not just not a safe lion, he's not a tame lion. God does not belong to us. He does not need us, and He is not ours to direct. In fact, much the opposite. We are His. And so, this text shows us that God can react, react to humanity as He pleases. Our understanding of what I guess we should call God's affections is a delicate thing. From the, from the earliest centuries of the church and in our own Westminster Confession, we say that God is without passions. And, and many have stumbled over that phrase. What does it mean? Think, thinking that being without passions, because we use that passionate, it means we have a lot of feeling. And people think that confessing this means that God has no affections in the absolute sense. They point to many passages that tell of God's love, wrath, or mercy. But the point is, is not strictly that God does not have affections, but that you cannot make God feel any certain way. You don't get to control God. Creatures do not affect God so that our actions determine His affections. God, if we could put this in sort of a, an analogical sense, God chooses how He will feel. He may choose to be merciful to sinners, or He may choose to bring the full force of His holy wrath against us. We read of this very thing this morning in Joel 2, 13 to 14, return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. Now, listen to this. Who knows whether He will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and drink offering for the Lord your God. So, do you see there that God has the character traits of being merciful and, and patient towards sinners, and yet there are times when even if God's people turned from their sins, they still had to say, who knows whether God will turn and relent and leave a blessing. So, we must never presume how God will react to us. God is not the predictable grandfather in the sky. God is a consuming fire. You cannot presume, no matter who you are, that even your repentance puts God on a leash. God chooses how He feels and how He deals with humanity. The untamed God is the God who is dangerous, the God who descended from His temple to smash Israel 
and Judah with foreign armies. That brings us to think about our second point, the undomesticated God. So we already considered how this text presents a God that people cannot control. He is beyond us. And now I want to think about the way that we, maybe not you as individuals, but our modern church setting has tried to domesticate God. And I have to ask you, what is the typical way that you think about God? Do you, do you think about God as a kind old neighbor who loves to have you in for tea? Is God just the cosmic Santa Claus that you approach when you really know what you want and are ready to ask Him? Do you think of God as the sort of housekeeper of the universe, whose main job is really just to keep human affairs in order so that things are good for us? Moreover, how do you think God relates to us? Did it catch you off guard in the previous point when I said that nothing people do can determine how God feels or what God will do? So many people think that God's at least default, if not only, stance towards humanity is weak love. They think God wrings His hands hoping we will come to Him. But Micah has proclaimed the God who will send His own nation into exile because they consistently rebelled against Him. If we think to our text, John Mackay, who taught at the Free Church College, taught Old Testament, noted the significance of verses 18, 8 to 16, sorry, and Micah having to pros- prophesy against Judah even after God crushed Samaria. And part of that was that often when we are not present at a tragedy, We refuse to learn from it. Judah carried on despite Samaria's destruction, refusing to see the relevance of that destruction for them. So often, though, we do the same thing in our theology. We know the moral failures in liberal theology. But so often we overlook how those grew out of their attempts to domesticate the sovereign God. Modern theology likes to talk about the suffering God. They say that God feels so deeply for His creatures that He entered into creation and adopted our suffering into His own being. And the point of this movement is to create a God who is identical in His feeling, who identifies with our suffering in in an emotional sense. But nothing can be further from the truth. People who think that way, who want suffering in the essence of God because we suffer, pretend that human suffering happens by accident. They forget that humans create human suffering. And we do not need a God who can feel our suffering, but one who can defeat it. So many of us, however, find it easier to think about God in comfortable terms. We want to say things like, Jesus is our homeboy, as if we can pretend that Christ was a 
laid-back hippie rather than the raw essence of God erupting into history clothed in human nature. God is not your house cat. The undomesticated God is the God who is forceful, full of power, full of majesty, and far beyond our comfort zone. And that brings us to think about our third point, the unpredictable God. So we've seen that there are ways that God is not a safe God. He's not entirely predictable, but is in fact the divine warrior who will fight his enemies. We have also thought about how this can shatter our modern categories of a tame God wanting nothing more than to feel alongside you. As true as all of what we've thought about so far is, however, I realize that it might leave you with lingering questions about how we can depend on God as entirely trustworthy if He is not predictable. If God is this great judge who will storm from His temple to crush even His own rebellious people, how are we to find assurance about our place before Him? And there's a straightforward answer to this for those of you who are trusting in Christ. God has already come down from His celestial temple to judge sin. Colossians 2, 13 to 15, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him by having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Did you hear that God triumphed over every power. He subjugated all the authorities to Himself. A judgment has come. And the shocking point of this text, especially in light of what we thought, the unpredictable part is that God took that judgment upon Himself. Christ, the eternal Son of God, came to this earth not to distribute God's judgment, but to bear it for His people. Whereas God turned His fury against the community of Israel because they broke His covenant for the sake of individual sinners here, God turned His fury against His own Son so that He could cancel our transgressions. For all who have sinned and violated God's law, even in thinking lowly of our Creator, there is shelter from God's judgment if we would hide ourselves behind Christ's cross. And that is how we Christians can know how God will treat us for forever. Our God who swore to enact sanctions against rebellious Israel has sworn to be good to those who trust in Christ. Romans 8.1 there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
the God who was long forbearing with individual sinners, but still full of fury for the community under the old covenant, has made an unbreakable covenant with those whom He will rescue. Those who recognize their sin and cast themselves upon Christ. The unpredictable God is the God who has committed to be predictable to those with faith in His Son. He has therefore earned our trust in Christ Jesus. And so let us run to Him now, knowing that this lion, this God, is not safe, but He is good. Let's pray.